Hello people, this is the first day of my new venture into YouTube I guess you could say. I've dabbled in YouTube on and off over the years, but nothing really substantial, not really thought of anything particular that I wanted to do with YouTube, no particular niches, uh, you know, nothing like that. And then it just suddenly dawned on me that the best thing I can do now that I've reached the giddy old age of five zero is just vlog, just talk about my life, talk about who I am, um, where I live, what I do, that type of thing. Because I am a firm believer that life is infinitely more, sorry, real life is infinitely more interesting than any scripted stuff and any fiction, I think is probably the word I'm looking for. This is my pet, this is Ella, the Labradoodle. She'll probably feature a lot in the videos. Um, yeah, she's generally my sidekick. But you'll see a lot of Ella as these videos develop. So obviously I'm out walking her at the moment and the plan is to try and get consistent with this and to try and post a single vlog every single day which will probably showcase my training, um, what I do at the gym, what I do in my home. I've got my home office that's got kind of a multi-gym setup in there, which you'll see when I take you back into the office. So this is our daily walk. I would twice a day I'd take her out. And she's a full of beans, this one. She's a character. I'm absolutely obsessed with chasing down a ball, which somehow we've lost already. Hello, where's the ball? Find your ball. Come on, get your ball. It's hard to find amongst all the leaves, but there we go. So I'm going to throw the ball and I'll continue walking and talking. I'm just recording these videos initially on, just on my iPhone. I've got an iPhone 13 Pro and that seems good enough to record pretty decent quality, to be fair. I think I've wanted to do a YouTube um, journey for quite a while now. Like I said, I've just never really known what to do it about. But I think I've had quite an interesting life. <laughs> um, as you'll discover over the coming days when I tell you a little bit more about my life. Things I've done in the past, places I've been, people I've met. They will all become apparent if you start watching these vlogs that I'm going to be putting up every day. Yeah, you've got to stay tuned. It's going to get interesting. How? Ella. How are you muddy already? I hate this damp, wet, muddy autumn weather. So it's no good for, for the dog because she intentionally decides to rub herself in all the mud. So every time I take her out for a walk at the moment, I'm having to take her home and buff her. Ella, you look like a panda. I took my eyes off you for one moment and you've done that. Mind you, it's not as bad as she normally looks. But we'll see, because that could get worse as this one. So this is what we do, this is the chase. I have the ball, I throw it, she runs back, runs for it, brings it back, but then doesn't give me it. She hasn't learnt the full, learnt the full art of uh, chase and retrieve and bring back. And sometimes she just completely ignores the ball, and leaves it for me to go and collect and then throw again. Yeah, she's a really good dog off the lead. Um, I've been able to walk her. She's six, just turned six actually. Oh, she's six coming up in a few days time. And ever since she was about a year, year and a half old, I've had her off the lead. And she's been a blessing. She's been absolutely good as gold. Never had an issue with cats, with other dogs. She's just full of life. She just loves the freedom that being off the lead has given her. Plus it also helps to uh, health and well-being and health and well-being her general fitness she hasn't got mental health issues for god's sake Stir. do you see what i mean this obsession with the ball this is the one thing that i was able to do that taught her to stay off the lead she gets fed up and then tries to knock it out are you getting bothered now okay Come on then. You ready? Go on. Yeah. 
got to be careful when I throw it around here because there's big muddy puddles everywhere. The drainage is not very good around here. And she will, being a Labradoodle, she's absolutely obsessed with finding puddles of water and then just swimming in them, going over on her back, covering herself in as much crap as she can. Surprised she didn't with that one, to be fair. Come on then. Come on. I've just been waiting for the uh, wind to die there. So I think the last little sequence I'll do of the, the outdoor bit here, the outdoor walk for this first video. Uh, the next time you see me, I'll be back in my house and everything will be in my home office, stroke gym, stroke man cave. <laughs> um, I've just, yeah, sorry, I was just waiting for the wind to die off because I'm just talking to the native camera um, on my iPhone and the microphone's just built into the phone. So when it's really windy, I may as well just talking in a wind tunnel, you can't hear a thing. There's a decent camera that I've actually seen um, that comes with a separate remote mic, and that's the Osmo Pocket. We've just brought out the third iteration of that, Pocket 3. Incredible looking camera. I think if I can really, if I, sorry, if I can get hold of one of them cameras, I can really get my A game on. Um, but I do want that camera, but it comes with a hefty price tag. I think in the UK, it's about 620 pound for the Creator Edition which comes with extras like a battery pack, an extra handle, um, and that remote, that microphone that you can kind of clip on here. It comes with really strong magnets and they, it comes with a wind buffer as well. So it helps with the outdoor noises. If you're gonna take a camera outside like I'm planning on doing. So yeah, hopefully if Santa's kind, I might get one for Christmas. Or maybe not, we'll see. Touch. On the walk, there's this house that's got a bowl, a water bowl for dogs. It's been here for ages. And they always fill it with fresh water every day. So as we get home, just before we get home, she knows that she can have a drink. However, it's empty today. Don't! So it's a glow ball that I took out with me. And it's useless. I thought it would glow like that all night long. <laughs> it doesn't. It stays like that for about five minutes, then it goes back to being not glowing. Piece of shit. Cost five pound that as well. Hello, come here. Oh, so I'm back in the house now, obviously. And you can probably see more of the dirt. She knows. Oh, yeah. You know what you've done. <laughs> You're covered. You have made yourself into a panda today. You really have. <laughs> you know, as bad as usual, I'll be honest, Ella. It does normally get a lot worse than this when we come in from our walks. So let's dry you. Here's your paw. Paw. Good girl. She gives me a pause because she knows that they're covered in mud. Right, I'm going to clean Ella and then I'll go into my office and I will resume. We'll resume today's vlog. The very first pilot vlog. Over for now. So I'm back in... I keep saying this, I'm back. I'm in my office now. The lighting's not great in here. See, I've got a social media ring on. Uh, to try and put an extra bit of lighting in here. Maybe I'll just change the ceiling lights, that might help. So I've got this tripod that I'm going to use for the majority of the stuff while I'm in here. You know, and I've just realised for years I thought this was broke because it does that. And I was twisting this knob here thinking it would tighten it and it doesn't. And I was about to throw it out and then I've just twisted that and lo and behold, it locks it into place. What an aegis I am sometimes. I haven't actually got the attachment to fit onto the top of here to mount an iPhone to it. So I'm using this, <laughs> as as this, my Gorilla Pod, I think it's called. It's really cool. It wraps around any object. Good to take out because you can stick them on fences, just flexible legs like this, wrap them around trees, pretty much put them anywhere if you want to set a camera up. Uh, I think they're called Gorilla Pods. I'm not 100% sure. So yeah, I'll use it on top of the tripod for now until I can find an attachment that fits into that. Here's the workroom. There's me in the mirror, obviously. I'm talking about pointing out the friggin' obvious, Alice. Uh, I've got a cross trainer in here. This is what I tend to do my morning cardio on. Um, I don't do any cardio in the gym. I tend to save the gym purely for doing weights. Oh, there's the tripod setup that I've just been showing you. I've got this treadmill that's folded up. I don't tend to do much running these days. I found as I've got a bit older, uh, my knee's been twinging a bit more. So I find the low impact cardio type stuff like this, 
There is a stair climber in the gym and I have used that occasionally, but I tend to just do the cross trainer now. I've got this uh, hanging pull-up bar thing as well. Looks like something out of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, doesn't it? I <laughs> uh, must be honest, I don't I haven't really been using that an awful lot since I've been a member of the gym. I've got one in there. And there's my piece to resist on. So there's my multi-gym. Funny story about that. Some chap was selling it. He was moving house. We've got a guy who lived around the corner from me. Um, and he was desperate to get rid because he was moving out the next day. And he initially wanted about £150 for it. And I'd said, no. So said, however, if you don't, find any takers if you're struggling to to sell it i'll take it off your hands for 50 which i didn't think he would come back to me but lo and behold the next morning he did because he just needed shot he was moving out of the house it was taking up space in his garage he needed it gone so i gladly um relieved him of it for 50 pound and it's took pride of place in my little man cave ever since and it does get used i'll be honest i've used it extensively um since i bought it you can do everything on it you can do legs chest it's got a lat pull down bar i can do my biceps triceps it's quite a versatile piece of kit probably the best 50 pounds i've ever spent <laughs> so yeah there's a theme going on here if you look around the room you'll see there's a lot of uh himalayan type things going on um mm, i wonder why you wonder but i'll talk to you about that in probably tomorrow's vlog um I don't want to reveal everything, give away far too much on this first episode, but I'll talk to you. I'll tell you the story of why I've got Himalayan, or sorry, Tibetan Buddhist prayer flags draped around my room and why I've got maps of Nepal, maps of the Mount Everest region. Um, yeah, going all the way around. So that's my room. That's my man cave, which is I've converted. So I do know the lighting's not great in here. I'm going to have to address that. Um, yeah, this is, it's not going to work, is it, otherwise? Because there's too much shade, too much shadowing going on here. So I am going to have to sort of illuminate this room a lot better than I am. Especially if I do some of the video logs in here, which I'm planning on doing some in here, to be honest. When I start talking more about training and fitness, um, I'll be using this thing. And I probably will do a lot in here. So I'll, yeah, I need to sort the lighting out. So that's it for today, guys. Um, yeah, that's my first episode. <laughs> I'm not going to reveal too much. You need to go and check out my Instagram. Um, I'm approaching 50,000 followers on Instagram, believe it or not. I know how I've done it, and I'll tell you how I've done it in tomorrow's video. So Britman Speaks on Instagram, as well as on YouTube here. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I hope I can keep it going. The idea is to try and do these videos every single day, uh, these video logs. And it's just real life. It's just raw unfiltered life as it happens today i'm gonna to go and buy some of these these spotlights that go into the ceiling and i want to get the ultra bright ones because the room was a problem on the first video so hopefully this will brighten up the room and make it much better for for using the video in there when i'm showing you some of the workouts that we're going to be doing including Ella, because she works out with me as well, to be fair. Especially when I do my morning breathing exercises, she lays right next to me. <laughs> These lens wipes are brilliant. I use them, you buy them in boxes of about 100, 150, and they're only about four or five pounds. And I use them for cleaning down my phone screen. They're, they're meant to be for glasses, for eyewear, sunglasses, glasses. Um, you know that type of thing but they're really good for my phone so i use these to to clean the lens on the phone get these to clean phone screens they're amazing right i'm in the car obviously i've just been to the electrical shop to get some bulbs to sort out the the light problem that i have in my man cave um so i've now got these spotlights up these gu10 spotlights i think we had these installed when we moved into the house and they're probably quite high wattage like 40 or 50 watt led bulbs but I've now gone for, uh, excuse me, these bright ones, these bright white low wattage. Let's see what a difference these make when I install six of these into the room. So let's go, let's go back home. And then Ella came along for the drive today. I'm gonna take her out for a walk after lunch. It 
it's not it should be a Thursday is normally a gym day. Yeah, but final I'm, thoughts. Oop, turn the radio down. I'm not going to go to the gym today. I'm having a rest day. Like I said, I've done about 10 days in a row now, which is not normal for me. I must be honest. I'll normally do four or five days and have a day off, a couple of days off, and then get back to it. But for some reason, I just felt very energetic and just wanted to push through. So I've done it. I've done 10 days and I feel okay for it. But yesterday I was doing sit down rows on my back and I felt. This morning when I woke up, I was a little bit twinging in my lower back. So I figured it was probably wise to, to rest up now and to, yeah, have a house day. Sort everything out in the house that I wanted to sort out. Tidy the room, um, get it ready for the uh, the YouTube videos that I'm going to be recording in there. And change the lighting and sort that out and get the lights really bright. Yeah, so come on then, Ella. Are you ready to go back? And we must get you out for a walk. So just to give you a little bit more context to, to sort of my background and my story if you like. I know in, in yesterday's video I showed the prayer flags and some of the Himalayan stuff that I had on my walls. Yeah, let's just that's up now. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that, there's a history behind that. So for those of you who don't know me, if anybody's watching this because you've linked into me from Instagram, um, you will see Obviously on Instagram, all you'll see is just the comedy stuff, the, the Elmo reels and things like that, which are hysterical, by the way. Um, but yeah, oh, sorry, Anna. I wrote two books. I wrote a book in 2016, and I wrote, I wrote a book in 2021. Uh, the book in 2016 was about my two attempts to climb Mount Everest in Nepal. And it's fair to say that things didn't go according to plan. In 2014, I traveled out to Nepal for my very first attempt. And then in 2015, I returned for attempt number two. The book's been out, the Everest book I wrote in 2016, it's called Everest, It's Not About the Summit. I mean, I should have called it the Everest Dream, because at the time I had a Facebook page called Everest Dream, basically. But I thought it was a bit tacky and a bit cheesy and I wanted a, a book to convey more about the actual whole ethos and meaning of the mountain to me. And it was a, it was a 20 year journey of my life um, to get to Mount Everest and to have, have that go at the summit. I mean, I'm being very, very blase about all of this, but obviously there's a level of experience required before you, you go out to Everest and, and tackle them out. So I was very much into the outdoors from a young age. You know, I was into hill walking, just being in the mountains. I just absolutely loved uh, the mountain air. You know, the, just the whole culture behind it, just the environment, just, it just sang to me. Everything about being in the great outdoors really sang to me from a young age. And then I went and saw a famous climber, a British climber called Doug Scott, who was the first British subject to reach the top of Mount Everest in 1975. And I saw him give a talk in my hometown and it's fair to say it changed my life. And I was in my late teens, possibly 20 year old when I saw this talk. And I knew, I thought, you know, I, I want a piece of that. I, this, this, I, I felt like I'd found myself in life. I felt like I found what I was meant to do. Um, and then I began, I began the journey. I began taking the steps to, to get out to Everest. So as I say, I was about 20 when I first discovered the mountain. I mean, obviously I'd heard of Everest. I knew what the mountain was. I knew it was the highest mountain in the world. I knew it was in a place called Kathmandu, or so I thought <laughs> at the time. Kathmandu obviously being the capital of Nepal. So I began the steps to, to get myself ready for, for Everest, to build up the accumulative experience, um, you know, everything like that that I'd needed to get out to the mountain. And then the one thing that I didn't really bargain on uh, when I took on this dream was the, the, the expense, the, the cost of climbing Everest. It's, it's not cheap. It's uh, quite an expensive escapade, that's for sure. So it, the expedition to get out to Everest, it eluded me um, several times before I was able to actually get there because the cost, I just couldn't get the, the money together. Um, it's astronomical amounts of cash required to go out to Nepal and you can go and trek to the base camp and that's, you can do that on a shoestring. As I did um, in the year 2000, in the millennium year, um, I'd just come out of a, a divorce. <laughs> 
married quite young, quite foolishly. Um, lasted about three years. Came out of a divorce and I decided I want to go and travel the world and see, see Everest, see the Himalayas. So that's exactly what I did. I, I quit my job at the time. I was, wasn't really eating much. I was just working in a, in a factory, uh, picking parts, just sticking them on a conveyor belt. Mind-numbingly dull work. But I, uh, I quit and went to see the mountain for the very first time in 2000. And as well as going to that talk six, seven years previously, this was another defining moment of my life that, that changed my life in unimaginable ways. Having been out to Nepal and then managed to get up to base camp and stand at the bottom of the mountain, gaze, gaze up into the Kumbu Icefall, which is like a frozen glacier of you know large blocks of ice, large seracs, the size of houses. Um, I knew that I wanted to come back and try and go all the way, and try and go to the top of the mountain. Um, but for me, that didn't actually happen for another 14 years. So from 2000 to 2014, I was just on a one-way mission to try and get back to, to the mountain. Um, I tried several years to raise the money and I just wasn't able to do it. I was not able to get anywhere near it. But then, ultimately, it all came good for me for the spring climbing season of 2014 when I was able to finally go out to the mountain with a small British commercial team um, and have my attempt at the mountain. And now that the book that I wrote about this expedition and then the book, that, uh, sorry, the expedition the year after that, the book's been out seven years now. So for those who do know me, it's, it's a well-known story about what actually happened in 2014. So there was an avalanche basically. In that ice fall a huge block of ice came loose and 16 Nepal mountain workers were, were resting uh, in the ice fall. They'd taken their, their backpacks off. They were sat having cigarettes and uh, cigarettes on Everest. I know. Um, and they were resting and unfortunately it was a case of wrong place, wrong time, when a large block of ice came crashing down off the climbing route. Um, and obliterated everything beneath it, including, as I say, 16 unfortunate poor souls who, who perished. And that systematically and effectively shut down the, the climbing on the mountain for that year. Nobody went on the mountain. It was the, the largest single loss of life on the mountain in history. Um, the last time there'd been that many casualties on the mountain was 1922, when seven Tibetan porters were killed in an, an avalanche on the north side as part of one of the uh, the British first British attempts on the mountain. So this was the largest loss of life for nearly a hundred years on the mountain and it was it was groundbreaking it was a, it was a pivotal moment in the history of the mountain. So I'd spent out all this money thousands upon thousands upon thousands of US dollars to get my attempt on the mountain maybe fifty thousand dollars and I didn't get any higher than I had done 14 years previously when I'd been trekking to base camp. And that trip only cost me a few thousand pound. So I came home with my head between my legs, shell-shocked at what had happened, feeling a bit cheated, a bit robbed that I'd not got my chance to achieve my dream. Grateful that I was alive, grateful that I got to come home and, and see my family and see my, my young daughters and my wife. And, you know, very, very grateful that I did get to return. But ultimately, I felt cheated out of the dream. I felt robbed. And I knew that I wasn't done with the mountain. I knew I wanted to go back. Um, and the best thing to do was to just return immediately. You know, keep the wheels of the, of, of, you know, keep the wheels going, keep everything turning, keep my motivation high, keep my fitness up, and, and just instantly return the following year. Because on Everest, you only tend to climb during the spring season, which is May. So you tend to head out to Nepal, April, end of April, uh, and then you'll have your summer attempt sometime in May. It's kind of a six to eight week expedition. So I had to wait till the following May, to, to, sorry, the following April to return to the mountain. Also, there was a small question of money. I had to then subsequently find a new amount of money to, to take my place back out on Everest in 2015. When I wasn't rich, never have been rich so the money was hard to, to come by 
it took a colossal effort to get the funds together for 2014. How I thought I was going to be able to do that a year later in 2015, it was just beyond me. Suffice to say I did. Suffice to say, long cutting a long story short, I was able to return in 2015. And everything was good. I genuinely felt in a better place, fitness-wise, mentally. The previous disaster from the previous 12 months, it, it didn't put me off. It, you, you know that when you go out to do big mountains like Everest, that they are dangerous, that the mountain can pretty much snuff out your life immediately um, if it chooses to. It's a risky escapade and there's no getting away from that. But it's calculated risk, and for me it was always calculated risk. I used to work on the statistics of, yes, it might happen, yes, I might be avalanched, yes, I might die of cerebral edema, I might get altitude sickness, I could die of exposure, I could fall off the mountain. These are all variables that you're very much aware of, but I played the game of statistics and odds and just thought, statistically, it's probably not likely to happen, but there is a chance. But there's a chance you get killed if you cross the road. There's a chance you get killed in a car crash, a plane crash. There's, there's, you know, there is risks in life and you can't not live your life because of risks. You just have to put it to the back of your mind, blank out all that noise and focus, laser focus on what you have to do. So for me, when I returned in 2015, I would, I'd done that very, very well. I'd been very successful in blanking out the noise. Um, and I genuinely thought it was going to be my year. I thought finally after years and years of dreaming that the mountain was going to let me summit this year. I was going to reach the top. But unfortunately, things transpired against me again and that didn't happen. And this time, Nepal was hit by an almighty earthquake, about a 7.4 magnitude quake. Oh, sorry, it might have even been 7.9 magnitude, I can't remember now. But what I do remember is that 9,000 people in Nepal were killed outright when buildings collapsed, villages were destroyed in the mountains. Uh, the epicentre of the earthquake was about 80 kilometres away from Everest itself, but it was that big enough an earthquake that it did send shockwaves and ripples across the Himalayas through to Everest. So I was actually climbing on the mountain. I was in that ice fall where the year before 16 climbers had been killed when the earthquake struck. And that was pretty much game over. The entire climbing route was destroyed beneath our feet. The base camp was obliterated. So the, the, our safe haven where I'd, I'd left six hours previously that morning was now completely destroyed utterly, utterly destroyed by a massive avalanche that swept through the centre of base camp, released from the, the effects of the earthquake. 19 people were killed down at base camp when the earthquake struck, and here we were stuck on the mountain for two days with nowhere to get off. So it was a very, very scary time. Obviously the mountain shut down again, nobody was climbing. I've just come back home now so I can now pull over and concentrate. Nobody was climbing again that year, so for the second year in a row, the mountain was hit by tragedy and disaster. And this time, 19 people died, so this became the biggest disaster on Everest since the previous year. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what was happening, and ultimately, I survived, obviously. I was able to come down off the mountain in a helicopter, as were all climbers trapped on Everest. Eventually got myself home and was just crestfallen just absolutely devastated that these two events had happened to me that I'd been caught up in these two big disasters on the mountain and I, as far as I was concerned that was that I had no idea what I was going to do the thought of the third attempt just didn't really cross my mind I promised my wife Tamara the year before that if something happened this time that that would be it there'd be no going back for a third time especially in light of the fact that I still had two young daughters so the risk element was was really high and I wasn't prepared to do that to them for a third time so I came home was absolutely devastated thought that was the end of it didn't really know what I was going to do and it's only when I had one or two people email me and ask if I'd consider I should write a book about this because it's not every day that you end up you, you find yourself caught up in two big disasters like this back to back 
So I, I genuinely think as Brits, we tend to celebrate failure as well as success. You know, there's no, it's no secret. I mean, you look back at the likes of Captain Scott, um, you know, Shackleton, all these epic stories of disaster where people have perished. Um, we have an interest in that. And it's the adversity, I guess, that, that interests and excites. And I thought about it. I, I took a few days to think, could I write about this? Because I have no intentions of writing a book. And then after thinking about it, I just thought, you know, there's probably a book here. There's probably a story somewhere around this. And that's what I did. I, I then spent the rest of the year into 2016 kind of writing my autobiography uh, about what Everest meant to me in my life, about how I took the steps to get to the mountain. Um, yeah, and then the book was released at the end of November, self-published. But that's all I'm going to say about it for now. The book's called Everest, It's Not About the Summit. I think I'll leave it there for now. I've spoke enough. Anyway, I'm home. Come on, Ella. Should we go and put these bulbs in? Yeah? Let's go and put the bulbs in. Are you coming? Are you ready? There we go. Take the seatbelt off her. Come on, then. And then we'll take you for a walk once I've done that. Come on, then. Come on.